everyone and welcome to FF Live. Um, for those that don't know me, my name is Brent Hoban. I'm co-founder and chairman at Founders Forum and also of First Minute Capital and Founders Factory and Karakuri um, uh, and a few others. Karakuri is relevant today because it's restaurant, uh, it, it's robotics that, for food prep. So um, I'm particularly excited to hear um, on this panel about some of these topics. Um, for those of you who may not know us at Founders Forum, we are a global community of the world's top tech founders, corporate CEOs, um, top investors, world leaders, and influencers. I'd like to introduce Rob Bland, a senior partner in McKinsey and Company's Silicon Valley office. Rob leads the North America geography for fuel, which as many of you will know, is McKinsey's group that serves startups and unicorns. Before joining McKinsey 13 years ago, Rob was with Rosetta Stone, first of head of operations and finance, and then product development, helping grow a $100 million business in four years. Rob has helped numerous high growth companies accelerate the creation of billions of dollars of enterprise value, connecting his original Rosetta Stone experience to his passion for client service. Rob, over to you. Thanks, Brent. Uh, you forgot to mention that uh, despite my last name, I am a big fan of food and have uh, really enjoyed the innovation that's been happening in the industry for the last few years, especially on e-commerce. Uh, so I am very excited to be your moderator for the session today. Uh, I've known Lydia for a long time, uh, and uh, I, I think we should all be proud to be able to have a conversation with Nicholas and Lydia today about an industry that has experienced massive change uh, in the last year in particular. Um, you know, Nicholas, uh, as everyone knows, founded Deliver Hero almost a decade ago. Uh, last year, he celebrated the company's inclusion into the DAX, uh, which is the top 30 German companies alongside traditional names like Allianz, Siemens, Deutsche Telekom. Uh, in the last few weeks, uh, Deliver Hero launched a new VC fund to drive innovation in food, announced it's raising 1.6 billion to look at attractive investment opportunities. And I know he's hungry to do more. Um, so thank you for joining us, Nicholas. Uh, and uh, Lydia uh, is uh, one of the top investors in the world and uh, oversees a significant global portfolio, including Coupon, Fanatics, uh, Tokopedia, and Kluke. Uh, and the entrepreneurs that she supports are famous for saying Lydia is always there for me. So thank you for joining us, Lydia. I did want to start before we get into the questions about the industry. Uh, given everything that's happened and uh, the way we're all living our lives now and the incredible global roles you both have, uh, how are you each doing today? Uh, Lydia, how are you? I'm suffering, I guess, from the after effects of letting my husband cut my hair this weekend. So I apologize to everyone. <laughs> I've been uh, told to stop playing with it, but it's just too damn short. Um, no, I, I think it's, uh, this is obviously an extraordinarily challenging time around the globe. We've been watching it very closely at SoftBank. As, as Rob mentioned, I have portfolio companies in Asia. So we have been in the midst of this for, for over a year at this point. Um, I, I will say we at SoftBank have been very, very lucky. Our portfolio companies have been lucky. I personally have been lucky uh, through this, but it doesn't take away the, st the sting of what our, our global consumer base and, and companies are experiencing. So um, we were talking before the call, there, there have obviously been some, some wonderful positives generally related to spending more time with, with family and, and children and being more involved in the day-to-day -day lives that we have outside of our work. Um, but these are, are difficult times and there's, there's no mincing words about that. How about you, Nicholas? No, I think under the circumstances, I, I've been very fortunate. Um, business has been doing tremendously well. Um, personally done also very well. So I think and I, I can be very lucky. Of course, it is tough times. Um, I wish this would be over. Um, and... Uh, <coughs> Yeah, no, other than that, I'm good. Uh, like Lydia, I, I had an accident yesterday, so I, I, I ran into a tree, uh, but apart from that, doing very good. Well, I'm glad you're uh, glad it wasn't worse. Um, obviously, you've been investing in and partnering with e-commerce brands for a long time uh, in geographies across the world. So you've had a bird's eye view in the way that the last year has changed uh, consumption patterns and industry growth. Um, how has this pandemic been different for retail and e-commerce versus the global financial crisis? 
Uh, and what are you seeing as the differences in the way it's showing up around the world? Yeah, thank, thank you, Rob. I, I think it's, it's probably worth, before we jump in, uh, making sure everyone is, is aware of the platform I operate from. Um, so, so SoftBank is a global holding co, effectively, um, which was founded by a gentleman named Masa Yosifshan and Masa. And his vision is to invest in businesses that enable the AI revolution. So to do that, we have transitioned over the past five years, SoftBank Group from an operating company that operated some of the largest mobile networks in the world to an investment firm. And within that, we have launched a series of funds, including Vision Fund One and Vision Fund Two. This effort is only a handful of years old. I joined SoftBank about six years ago and, and the Vision Funds are about half as old as that. Um, but they currently today after, um, about four years of investing, we believe our portfolio represents the largest collection of disruptive companies on the planet and, and is really very global in, in, uh, in its purview. So if, if we, um, the, the problem state we're, statement we're seeking to solve is that AI will have a greater impact on the economy than the PC internet or, or mobile internet before it. And what we see today in some ways accelerated by COVID is just an, an extraordinary amplification of the value that these companies have been driving to consumers. And so to answer more specifically Rob's question, if you flash back to 2009, we need to remember that e-commerce was actually still very nascent back then. It only represented about 5% of total retail sales, We're north of 30% probably today and much higher in some of the economies in which I spend time. I have the, the great benefit of having an e-commerce portfolio that spans from Korea to India, Indonesia, the United States, um, spend time with our, our e-commerce platform, platforms in Japan and in, in, uh, and in China. And I think what is, there are a handful of things that are universally true across these portfolio companies. And one of which is there's been an enormous investment in infrastructure. Um, and that very specialized infrastructure, including fulfillment and logistics, has, um, has really led to a, an enormous benefit to consumers in terms of being able to access goods in a time of, generally speaking, but in a time of COVID, certainly so, as, as you see a real shutdown of businesses around the world. Um, I think one of the probably under the radar things that we talk less about has been a real globalization of assortment. And so I think this audience is, is mostly US and Europe. And so just as a reference point with, with a company everyone's probably familiar with, if I had to guess, I would think probably about 40% of the merchants on Amazon's marketplace are, are Chinese sellers. And so if you think about the, the contours of both of those things together, a globalization of assortment and a, a really differentiated set of infrastructure, you've seen a real compression of pricing of goods to consumers. And, and I think what is similar in the 2009 downturn to today is in an economic downturn, um, customers benefit they, from having lower prices. And I think that has been the core value proposition of, of e-commerce. So I'm happy to talk much more about specific things we're seeing around the world. Um, but I, I think the, the takeaway in my mind is we have been investing for 15 years in, in infrastructure and relationships. And, and this is a really unique point in time where these businesses have been unique beneficiaries. And, and I think importantly, consumers are unique beneficiaries of, of the work that's been done leading up to now. And what have you seen as you think about the different uh, entrepreneurs you get to partner with uh, as different ways they've responded to the change and uh, how you would therefore offer advice to all of our participants today to think about responding to a change like this? Yeah, I, I think this, it's, it's interesting. I, I don't think this has been one change. I, I think about the velocity of, of information flow and, um, in different stimuli that these companies have had to react to. And so I'm reflecting back on January, February, March, when we were, were so much fear of the unknown um, and everyone was trying to figure out would consumer demand hold up? Um, would we be able to actually serve it? Could we get what we now know as essential workers out on the street? Um, you know, if I flash back, we had issues across all of our companies with how do we actually get people to come and do that hard work of the delivery to the consumer during this difficult point in time? And so then you flash forward a handful of months forward to thinking much more discreetly about now we know more and how do we make sure that we're protecting our workforce and are protecting our customers um, while scaling to the fastest 
growth in, in demand that some of our companies have ever seen. And, and at large scale, these are not small companies seeking to, to scale up demand. These are companies seeking to go from you know, $10 billion companies up to $20 billion of volume. And that's very hard to do on fixed infrastructure. And so when I look at um, the entrepreneurs who have been so extraordinary through this, they have been able to absorb the, the, a lot of ups and downs very, very quickly and, and pull teams together and, and find rapid responses to these problems to markets that are closing and reopening and, and restrictions and government regulation. Um, it's a lot of very fast problem solving that we're seeing right now. And so I, I think um, what has universally been true across the portfolio is that the people who handle this best are, are tend to be very, very laser focused on just what is the core problem that we're trying to solve and are able to be quick and, and agile and, and problem solving around those core problems. Thank you. And let me just encourage everybody uh, who are, is participating today to feel free to uh, add questions to the chat. Uh, we will spend at least the second half of the hour uh, encouraging you guys to share your questions and creating more dialogue that way. Uh, but Nicholas, let me turn to you for a minute. So obviously, uh, it's been a huge acceleration uh, in the business in the last year. Um, and uh, the, the growth of quick commerce is something that uh, we all knew was happening, but certainly is faster now. Uh, as you guys have expanded into new categories like groceries, uh, pharma, or flowers, uh, how have you seen customer expectations change? I think in general, it's been more of an opportunity that has arisen, and that there's been uh, not necessarily an initial stage that they expected us to deliver groceries or expected us to deliver uh, a flower pharmacy product. But of course, it was a big opportunity for us to expand and double down on those areas. And we have seen tremendous happiness among the customers. So the, the MPS scores and the happiness has gone through the roof uh, to our service. So I, I don't think necessarily during the pandemic that was the expectation but of course there's been a huge demand and we have been fast in in making sure that it fulfilled that demand um i think now that expectations are like anything and now it's there and and now the expectation will keep on rising and i think we 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 kind of set the bar pretty high when we speak about groceries we have had ambition to deliver under 15 minutes and in some markets we are as slow as 11 or 12 minutes delivery of groceries from click until someone is at your door and and of course that is people have been wow but by that experience uh, we've also done it pretty with with low cost so we have done with free delivery and other uh, other alternatives so now, of course, the challenge comes that now we have wowed the customers. And the, the, the expectation is probably that it should be below 15 minutes. It should be free delivery. And, and the question is how we can keep on building on that expectation. Um, but and, and I think now, I don't know, now versus one year ago, I think a lot of people expect that anything can be delivered, uh, which is, is kind of good as well as, uh, as a little bit of a challenge uh, as well. So, um, yeah. And I wonder, uh, obviously, from a uh, lives and livelihood perspective, we all want to uh, get past the pandemic. Uh, but I wonder, Nicholas, how you think about the uh, preparing your business for a time when people may return to a bunch more restaurant consumption and uh, spending time out in the world and uh, consuming less, a 15 minute or less delivery. Yeah. So we, we are probably not as focused on trying to forecast um, what will happen. And we, we, we focus on making sure we build the best out of things as of now and as far as we can see. But it's very hard to know what will happen in six months and 12 months and, and 18 months. But we do know that the, 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 the service that we have been delivering is, is going to be, I don't know, people will still expect that to happen. Uh, we got probably a year or two of adoption rates, especially when it comes to other items than, than uh, food. To what extent that growth will maintain, uh, it, it doesn't impact our business so much. And we grew with 100% uh, prior to COVID, we grow with 100% now. Um, and if that drops with uh, 10 or 20%, will not materially change our business. Um, we also have some markets that's been usually beneficiary, but we also have a lot of markets that have been complete curfews and where we have zero orders for, for three, four, five, six months, uh, where we haven't yet come back to the demand that we had prior to the COVID situation. So I, I, I think we tr 
and of course we have a view on what will happen but we don't completely change our, our business strategy still to be the best possible product and service and and uh, um and the, the growth and we have a fairly variable way of, of approaching our growth as well yeah. mm. well let me turn to uh 100 growth per year <laughs> and uh, let's talk about scaling businesses you know certainly from the outside uh, it always seems like the businesses that both of you have been involved in are scaling seamlessly uh so it's really a question for both of you uh is that true is that fair uh are we underestimating it and again just putting myself in a in the entrepreneur's shoes, uh, what advice would you have for how to uh, scale rapidly? You want to start? Yeah. So, um, no, it has not been seamlessly. I think the last couple of years have probably been easier than the first six, seven years. Um, so I think it was harder scaling from uh, five people to 50 people to 500 people to 5,000 people to, to 30 or 35, 40,000 people that we have today and uh, not including the riders, of course. So, uh, and I think the challenge is when you go through the process, you have different investors, you have different investor interests, someone exits, someone I think long-term, uh, you're then squeezed between uh, your, your shareholders and your employees and their expectations and you're, you, you can at times be very lonely um, in your view. You also do a lot of hiring mistakes, um, partially because you're scaling fast, but also partially because you're not experienced enough in making those hiring decisions. Um, you also change your role, job role dramatically. If you manage a company with five people or 50 people or 500 or, or 5,000 makes a big difference in how you operate as a manager. And that has been very tough and, and painful learnings, at least for me. Um, and uh, I, I truly had moments uh, during this journey where I said, no, I, my, my life is miserable and I, 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 I can't stand it. But luckily also had a lot of positive learning moments where I, I felt it was fantastic and we overcome it. And at no point did I, did I, did I want to give up. And I guess that's that's the resilience of, of entrepreneurs, and and uh, that that you stick with it in in in, in easy and hard moments. And uh, I think since Black Period, it, it has been much easier for me. Uh, the growth has come uh, at at less cost of, uh, um, and the capital has been there in that sense. We were not constantly out fundraising. We we're not constantly short on cash. Uh, we had the investors who don't want to be part of the story anymore. They can sell the stock. Um, therefore, I can only tell the story that we are going to build and everyone who wants to buy into that, they buy into that and everyone else is, is not there. And that is different when you're a private company. Uh, you, 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 the, the, the change of investor is not happening uh, fluidly. Um, and, and that was something that was very tough for, for me, at least, um, to live through. I think Nicholas articulated that beautifully, which is the problems are different at different points in time, but it is always difficult and, and different degrees. And so I was just reflecting on uh, the various stages that Nicholas talked about for his business. And, and certainly I think for all of the businesses I work with, they've been through similar times. Um, and whether it is first trying to find that business that really resonates with a consumer base and, and you can scale or whether it's fundraising challenges or alignment issues with the various shareholders around your table. Um, I, I do think this is a hard, hard business problem that people are trying to solve. Um, I guess I, I try and go back to what is under your control. And, and I think um, the, as, as I look at fundamentals of businesses, the, the goal of building a market leader is almost always about building a moat versus competitors. And moats can take many, many forms. They can be physical infrastructure, or cost of servicing improvements, or they can be operational uh, excellence. And I'm sure some of that will resonate with, with Nicholas. Um, I, I don't think you build a business like his without being truly op just operationally excellent. Um, but what's always been true, and it's a learning that I reflect on, is that marketing spend alone doesn't get you there. And, and so um, it's funny thinking about capital and how it, sometimes it makes business building feel easier or Harder and, and, and I'm so thrilled to hear Nicholas is at that point in time where he has a business with uh, the product market fit that really works and capitalization is easy. 
um, easier. Access to capital is easier. Um, but these journeys are hard. And I, I think it's um, looking at any of the companies in our portfolio, I, I, I don't think that ever changes. Um, but I, I'll, maybe I'll just reiterate what I said before, as I think about the best companies that, that I've had the pleasure to work with, They're, they tend to be very focused about how to create real value for consumers. And um, that doesn't mean that these companies aren't thinking about next legs of growth, but they have allocated their time consistently with what their priorities are and are ensuring that core priority receives the attention it, it deserves. And I think those are the things that are in your control as an entrepreneur that, that make a lot of sense to focus on. Um, but I, I think from a SoftBank standpoint, we have thought a lot about these problems that our portfolio companies address and, and that they address across, that they're experiencing across the, the portfolio, um, not the one-off problems that one company experiences, but the ones we see over and over. And, and as a response to that, we have actually built a couple different core functions that I utilize pretty often inside SoftBank. And, and one of those is our operating group. So we pulled together a network of um, experienced executives from across a wide array of industries. And they can uh, come and work alongside me and other members of the investment team to think through how companies can, can uh, improve launching of new products or new markets and, and how we can better leverage this extraordinary SoftBank ecosystem we're a part of. I think as a, a reference, um, we have the largest enterprise sales force in Japan. And so for enterprise companies thinking about launching in, in the Japanese market, which is still the third largest in the world, it can be a really exciting partnership opportunity and, and something that we love to think about how we can help with. Um, and the other piece is the capital markets group because Nicholas said it well, the, the public markets are a, a, um, a very liquid environment right now that can be a much more attractive financing source for many, many companies. And I think something that we're trying to work through with our portfolio companies is making sure that those entries into public markets are as successful as possible. And so we have a big capital markets group that thinks about how to access equity and debt capital markets. So I'll, I'll stop there um, other than to reflect that there, um, there are lots of different partners along the journey. I think we're trying to think about how we can be value add and some of the most important steps for mature companies. Um, but, but the journey is long and complicated. And so um, you know, it's, it's something I think that is common across this entire industry. Just follow up on uh... Something you mentioned, Nicholas, you said uh, it's been very lonely at times. And that's something that I hear from all of the entrepreneurs that I uh, work with and advise. Would you mind saying a little bit more about what that looks like for you? So I think in the early days, and I'm not sure if it's the same today, but in the early days, it was, it was hard to raise capital. Uh, but you still have to motivate teams to join your company and management members to take stock in your company and work on significantly less compensation than they could have gotten otherwise. You feel like you're obliged to, to keep up a, a good sign that things are good, things are on track. Financing is not a problem. Uh, you say it during interview process and you, you, you feel at some point like, holy wow, if, if I don't get this delivered, if I can't get this funding erased, I have literally been lying to, to or I, I, I literally, lying is maybe too hard of a word, but I've literally been misleading them to join this company uh, on false premises or on, on expectations that I'm not fulfilling on my, my, myself. So you're always balancing this of trying to give transparency, but at the same time, you keep some stuff for yourself because you're afraid if they knew how bad it is, they, they will not join or they will, they will, they will panic. Uh, so sometimes, you, you, at least for me, it, it took a long time until I had a team where I could be completely transparent. Um, it took many years until, I, and, and I had a moment when I said, here's the reality. Here are all the bad things. And, and that was a very re revealing moment or a very nice moment for me because I also felt, suddenly felt that the team was, they, they were aware and they were like, they, they heard it and they got very engaged by it and, and we all fight in the same direction. Uh, but it took me four or five years to get to the point where I felt I could share that transparency, at least with my core team. Um, and, and until that point, it, it was a very lonely journey, me um, um, kind of managing expectations and managing the team without sharing all the details. Maybe Lydia, I'm sure you've experience the same thing from the entrepreneurs you support, um, how would you, how do you support them going through that uh, same process? 
Yeah, I, I'm reflecting on, on what Nicola said, and it's almost certainly true for, for everyone uh, who goes through this journey. I think what I would articulate is that my best relationships are with founders um, where we have found a way to really trust each other. And that's not always easy to do. Everyone's coming with different incentives to, to every discussion. Um, but I, I think if you can build a relationship where you can really trust each other, having that, uh, that person across the table that you know believes in you and is going to be honest and, and direct with you, but will help you navigate some of this stuff, I think could be very valuable. I think that's hard to do. Um, very practically, but, but I think it can be quite valuable. So, um, so I, I would encourage uh, people to, to find investors that you can be honest with and to be very transparent um, because that transparency in many ways just helps develop your relationship. Um, and rather than scaring them away, I think it actually helps make those relationships stronger and stronger relationships lead to a much easier path when it comes to the, t the difficult times, the tough times. That, that is always the question. Um, how do you navigate tough times together? And I think that has everything to do with trust and transparency along the way. And I think maybe if I add one more thing that I, I feel among entrepreneurs, or at least I felt sharing my experience is that as to scale organization, I was not used to manage I don't know, 500 people and 5,000 people and, and so on. And you, you somehow set very high expectations on yourself. And you feel like maybe I'm not there, and and I have to keep up the level of of that people believe that I'm there, or you almost you don't want to show your weaknesses because you realize what if they knew that I have no idea what I'm talking about, or what if they knew that I, I, I and and I think it was also a moment when I tried to be something I'm not. I I, I thought that maybe I have to be show that I'm better than I am because otherwise I'm maybe not qualified for it. And I think that is something that I've learned to live with is like, and we all have our flaws, we all have our strength. And, and part of that strength I know, is, is, is to, to, to bring good people on board and to, to making sure that you facilitate that discussion and take help when you need help. But, but for me, that was not so likely. Uh, and I, I, I felt that I, it took a long time for me to also be transparent in, in, in my strength, my weaknesses, and, and kind of accept that I don't know everything either. Um, and, I, and, and for everyone, it was natural. They saw my weaknesses. It, it, was, it, was, it was stupid to believe that I wouldn't have seen it, that I could cover up for it. Um, so the, the best you can do is, is still to, to, to show it because they know it anyways. I, I love what Nicholas just said, which is um, I think founders take so much on their shoulders. And, and I think we have this expectation that founders are supposed to know how to do everything, how to be good at inspiring a team and, and good at capital raising and, and good at managing the books. I mean, we have this expectation founders can do everything. Um, but I think that the faster that we acknowledge weaknesses and talk openly with each other, the more we can all help each other broach the stuff. And it's not maybe not realistic to do that prior to getting someone on your cap table, but I think the sooner you do it after getting them on your cap table, probably the better off that founder's sanity is at the end of the day. Well, I do want to uh, open things up to audience questions. And uh, I think Frederick, uh, in addition to having asked the first question, I thought asked a very good one about uh, the Thrasios of the world. So Frederick, would you mind uh, coming on camera to ask your question? Because I think that's been a very interesting phenomenon that uh, it would be great to get your question and then uh, panelists' reflections on. Sure. Thanks a lot, uh, Rob. I hope you can hear me. So yeah. I'm uh, calling from Berlin. I suppose Nicholas is, has been here very often. So um, what we see in Berlin are both trends, two trends. One is the instant delivery companies who pop out. And obviously one company has um, successfully shown um, um, flush and post, how to make a very successful business by having a relationship to end consumers. And the second trend is we see here every other week, a new uh, Trasier clone coming up. And um, so I have two questions related to that trend. On the one side, when you go on Amazon, I think it's a paid listing experience, right? It's actually really a poor experience. On the other side, when you think about now you have these conglomerates coming up, buying a lot of small merchants, I think it can only get worse, right? So, and I understand from a macro point of view how valuable these companies are and, you know, that this is actually all these have a proof of concept and, it's a new way of val validating a market fit and so on and so forth. But I was wondering, 
because it's all within this Amazon hub, you know, what, do you, what is your, maybe your view or your critical view, um, how this is going to evolve in the next 24, 36 months? So you want to take that first? Yeah, sure. Uh, so um, <clears throat> my answer is not what I, what I would hope for, it's more like how I think the world is evolving. And that would always be, there will be small companies cup, know, popping up and, and find innovative solutions. And then you'll have big companies uh, trying to catch up and making sure that they, they build out their moat and build out their strength and build on their customer base and build on their... Um, the value proposition and there will always be a little bit of a um, um, how shall I say that 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 a small startup will have the speed and agility and they'll have no legacy and they will be fast and they'll be incredibly well and then there will be the big guys who have a lot of strength resources power money um, and and sometimes the small companies will 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 beat uh, that the, the strength of this local entrepreneur will, will, will outpace the advantage of, of scalability and, and resource and so on. And sometimes it will be the other way around, that, that the, the, the large company will and leverage their scale and size and knowledge and data and, and, and so on. And I think it comes market to market, country to country, compared to competitor. Um, I think there's always an opportunity for small startups. And I think it has been proven over and over and over again that they are able to build a lot of value and sustainability and they are building their own path. Some of them are being sold because that's the other tool that some of the big companies are using that they acquire them once they get to a certain size, a certain scale, they try to acquire them. So I think you will have cases of startups doing their own path, building a uniqueness and, and they succeed in building that and, and, and get, get the size and scalability on their own. Um, there will be cases where they exit to a large guy, and there will be cases where the large guy will have have will will will, will win with their advantages, and and it very much depends on on the, the market and the strength of of both the startup as well as the speed and agility of that big company. Um, so, when if I would speak to Germany, I don't know, I. I, I, I I, I, I think the startup will, will have a very clear chance to, to, to build something strong and well um, and, and that they can outpace the, the big guys. Yeah, Frederick, I, I guess I would start with, um, I, I'm a big fan of, of Amazon and, and what they've built. Um, what they are fundamentally is, is a customer promise. They're a customer promise for delivery on a given set of in a, in a given timeline. And they've done that through building a big infrastructure moat. Um, and they've done that through a consistency moat. And they've done that through proving out a wider array of selection that I think most people can provide at this point in time. Um, they won't be the only player in commerce forever. I do think we'll, we'll see innovations. We're seeing innovations now around live commerce in specific regions of the world, which I think are really interesting. I think that will um, probably develop in fascinating ways off the back of big social top of the funnel plat uh, platforms around the world. So I, I think we're not in the final inning yet. I, I think we will see innovation that disrupts, um, but there are big moats around Amazon and those are, those are important and will be hard to displace. Um, from a Thrasio perspective, you know, there's, you're, you're right, these are popping up all around the world. They're popping up in Latin America, they're popping up across Europe, they're popping up everywhere, and they're popping up because it's a tried and true, almost private equity style business model, which is how do you buy at a cheap multiple, aggregate, drive more efficiencies, professionalize small businesses, and then benefit from larger scale and a more professional organization for a higher exit multiple. Um, I think that's a, a tried and true business model. I think what is untested right now is the, uh, the very core of what Amazon and other platforms seek to do is, is drive lower prices for consumers. And that means disintermediation of middle people, middle men, middle women. Um, and, and Thrasio fundamentally in some ways is a, a middle individual. Now today it's driving more efficiency and a better experience for, or for customers. Um, over time, will we see the continuation of the exact same trend we've been watching for a long time, which is disintermediation? Maybe. Maybe we'll go right to factories, which is frankly exactly what Amazon's focused on doing. Um, and so I think we're at an intermediate point. I'm not ready to call the game and say that this model will win. Um, I think there's too much innovation coming around the corners. I'm really interested in some of these social platforms from a commerce standpoint. 
Um, but this is all exciting because I think at the end of the day, it fundamentally benefits the consumer base. Now, it, it's certainly going to harm a lot of individual small businesses along the way. And I think there's a social question to be asked and, and there's a room for government to be involved in this. Um, but generally speaking, I think this globalization that we're seeing, this drive towards efficiency and a better customer experience is, is generally speaking, a positive thing for society. Uh Ross Walker, I want to call on you to ask you a question, if you wouldn't mind, about the impact of quick commerce and hyperlocal delivery on uh, the high street and uh, sustainability. Yes, thanks very much, guys. And thanks for your candidness as well when answering these questions. Um, so, yeah, the, the question is around, you know, how do you see key commerce, you know, affecting um, the high street and small and medium enterprises that still predominantly operate offline? Uh, and kind of following on from that, um, how do we start to reduce the distance from source to door through the lens of kind of sustainability? So we're talking mainly about grocery there. Yeah. So I think people go online and our customers demand to get their products delivered online and uh, either they get it from Amazon or they will have to, or, or they will get it somewhere else. But um someone having a physical store today will have to adopt. And I think the way we see it and the way we contribute to this ecosystem is that we give them a tool and an ability to also serve online because I think only being offline will not be enough. And if it's not enough, it also means that it cannot survive and eventually it will only be online. So I think the fact that we can additionally drive on a traffic to their online presence we can actually make them more sustainable um, to, to stay and, and thrive. Um, and um, I think the way we see it also is that we, 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 we are very happy that we actually support rather the local ecosystem, that someone has a shop, but a shop is also a warehouse and where you can ship things from. So they have an advantage against an Amazon in the sense that they can be even closer to the customer and it can be faster in delivery if they only have that last mile, which they together with us can have. Because the alternative, uh, an alternative way of storing products is to ship from somewhere to a big uh, warehouse, centrally Amazon or similar, um, and, and then to the customer. But, but I think the local shop can leverage the fact that they can together with us deliver faster and therefore also have a sustainable path. I then also hope that uh, we, and when we speak about groceries and so on, that we, we, we build enough closeness to the customers that we can deliver fast, but also more sustainable in that sense. Um, so the more shops and warehouses are out there, uh, the shorter the distances will be for uh, logistic and delivery. Um, so um, I, I, I hope also from a more sustainable environmental point of view, this is a good thing uh, as we drive, drive, drive on. Yeah, I, I love the question because I, I think taking a step back, you know, communities and cities need small businesses. They need local businesses. We need that vibrancy to uh, have a high quality of life and to support property values and to support uh, general happiness. I, my, our founder is known for talking about investing in happiness. And I think that in some ways is the right way to look at it. How do we continue to support the things that make the places we live a valuable place to live? And I, I think um, that is the thing that probably worries me the most about this extended COVID period is will our government um, bodies be fast enough uh, to support the survival of these localized businesses that we all know we need in the future? Um, but I, I think on the optimistic side, I'll, I'll basically reverse what I said in the prior question, um, which is I have been astounded at how fast offline businesses have been innovating and figuring out how to navigate this new environment. Now, I, I won't talk about restaurants because I don't know anything and Nicholas is the expert, but I do think for the offline retailer, um, we've seen a very rapid move to figuring out how to utilize online tools and how to use them in tandem with the assets the businesses already have, including those local storefronts. And so I, I have been really pleasantly surprised and continue to be optimistic in a way that I probably wasn't 10 months ago about how resilient and resourceful small businesses are. Doesn't mean that we don't need to support them, um, but I think they will survive long beyond this. And the tools that I'm seeing developed on the technology side to support small businesses, I think are really impactful and, and will allow the these businesses to, to survive and support a customer base that has already voted with their dollars in terms of saying how important they are to the communities. 
from a sustainability standpoint, you know, we're, we're thinking a lot about um, the importance of sustainability for all of us and future generations. And it's something that we're spending more time thinking about investing in as a platform. Um, it's, you know, I, uh, I think there's probably one positive benefit of COVID, which is we've all stopped traveling around the world all the time, which has got to be good for global warming. Um, but on a more serious note, I, I think um, some of this disruption we're talking about, this disintermediation of multiple different layers includes things like transport of goods. And so I think the more we can figure out how to streamline these processes and to um, match up local supply with local demand, the, the probably the better off we're gonna be on a global basis. And so those are things that we're excited about that we're looking for entrepreneurs to, to seek to solve and to come and talk to us about. I just uh, wanna add my own perspective on the sustainability portion of that question, which is, uh, most of the world's commerce system is incredibly inefficient today. And the number of layers, as Lydia said, to go from a producer to a consumer uh, are various and mass. Uh, and I think uh, anytime we've looked at this, you know, actually the opportunity to clean sheet the way that you get from a producer, whether that's a grower or an artisan or a product maker directly to where the demand is, uh, there's just massive opportunities from AI, from new logistic systems. And I think that actually is very good for the, both the environment and for the creation of new entrepreneurs to create platforms for, uh, you know, people closer to the source to be able to do that work. So I, I remain incredibly optimistic about the ability to uh, impact that. Um, I did want to uh, give uh, Eric Hoffman a, a chance to ask a question. Uh, you, you were asking, what's your vision for uh, products in the future? Uh, uh, Rob, thank you. I appreciate it. And, and Nicholas, um, super fan of Delivery Hero and Food Panda here in the Philippines. Um, see a lot of um, a lot of movement toward farm to table to groceries. What do you see as the vision for new products and services two, five, ten years out uh, for the space? Oh, um, so so. The, the, the way I see a lot of innovations also happened in the past is most innovation is just happening gradually, but it happened consistently uh, and it has a compounding effect. So um, when you look at our service today versus I don't know, four or five years ago, you will be like, whoa, what an innovation here. If you look at it every month or every quarter or even year, you'll be like, well, it's the same thing. It's a little bit faster. That's true. It's have a few more products. That's true. But, but it, it, and, and I think therefore I, I tried to view it more from a consumer point of view. What, what do I expect to deliver? And I expect to deliver anything uh, more or less. Uh, I expect to deliver it very fast and um, in, in, to a very good price. And now for each of those aspects I mentioned now, there is a lot of innovation. So how can we drive down the, the price? And that can be, yes, maybe it's the farmer to the table. Uh, and we look at a lot of things like also with the groceries, with Pindadao and similar in China, how, how they, they try to make it cheaper and, and, and better for consumer. And faster will also be, how can we use uh, automation, uh, robotics, uh, warehouse management, the tools to, to make it faster? How can we build more stores such that delivery times go down and accessibility increases? And how, how can we improve our logistic uh, to, to make that five minutes faster, two minutes faster and so on. So I think, and, and, and so I think, most of the innovations, at least that I can foresee, is rather all, like all those small, tiny things that we improve every single day. And it never feels like it's groundbreaking, but when you look over time, it has become groundbreaking. Um, so so that, that's how I like to see it. Then, of course, there's always a once in a generation kind of thing that a mobile phone comes which puts everything upside down, or maybe AI, and it can also put a lot of things upside down. But those are very hard to know exactly how they, they do it. Uh, and therefore, I spend a little bit less time on trying to figure that out and rather spend time on continuously improve. What we do though is that we, we have set up a venture fund as an example, and we do a lot of experiments ourselves that we build up, I don't know, we build up our own kitchens as an example and try to automate or put in certain supply chain and, and robotics in order to make the, 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 the kind of dark kitchens more efficient or 
uh, work on payment solutions and a lot of innovations there. Um, we, we under the whole DMARCH where we set up stores or um, so there's a lot of things that we do, we try out and see how it works. And if it works out well, we scale it drastically. We also set up, as I said, a VC fund to invest in seed round, uh, seed rounds, which also helps us to, to understand the world a little bit better on where we can put our money, our bets, how the future evolving and, and so on. So, um, so, so, so in that sense, we, we also outsource a little bit of, of that new thinking and innovation in, in game changing things rather than these incremental steps that we focus most on. Very exciting, sir. Thank you very much. Thanks. Anna, can I invite you to share the question that you just shared about uh, thinking about on-demand delivery, ghost kitchens, et cetera? Yes, hello. Um, yeah, so I work for a hospitality tech company. So I know you've been talking a lot about general e-commerce, um, but obviously it's a bit of a different ball game when it comes to restaurants and food delivery. So just had particularly for Nicholas, like, you know, marketplace, delivery marketplace. How do you see the future of that um, developing? And in particular, do you think that marketplaces or just delivery fulfillment is which one is going to be, we're going to be seeing more of? And you mentioned about ghost kitchens. It would just be good to get your thoughts on what you think about any of that in dark kitchens. Yeah. Yeah, so, so I'm, I'm generally a believer that logistic company will be more efficient when it comes to logistics. So I think the scale and size enables us to, to be more efficient. And I think what sometimes holds us back or makes us sometimes that marketplace actually works better is that, th that there are a lot of... Um, there are a lot of scrutiny on everything a, a big company is doing. So um, while a small company can be a little bit more free in how they operate, I believe. Um, so I think that sometimes makes it hard to be a, a big company. Um, we, we, and, 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 and sometimes there has been more efficiency on the marketplace restaurant or marketplace to actually do it themselves. And they have been able to do it even cheaper than us despite us doing 50 or 100 million almost of delivery uh, deliveries per month. But eventually I think that the efficiency is gonna outpace any, 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 any negative side on, on being a large company. Um, and therefore I'm more a believer of uh, logistic companies actually helping there. And, um, and, and I think mainly also because the service level we have seen has been in, in most cases better. I'm not saying in every case, but in most cases also a little bit better. Then uh, um, I think when it comes to, to, to grow or like dark stores or ghost kitchens and so on, I think in general, the world is going to, to more specializations. And I think over time there will be restaurants who are just amazing experience when you want to go there and, and have an amazing meal, an amazing environment is unbeatable in some cases to go out to a restaurant and we cannot fulfill that at home. But then there are also a lot of cases when I feel like I don't want to go to a restaurant, I want to sit in my PJ and I want to eat something and watch Netflix or whatever it is. And then of course, th th then th that, that, I don't know, the delivery becomes very convenient. And I think there will be more specialization because there is a different way of cooking for someone sitting in a restaurant with a perfect experience. And they want to have their, whatever they eat in, in, in a special way and, and, and they expect that versus when they do delivery with a high degree of uh, high volume and, and some more standardization in the processes. So, um, um, Therefore, I think that those ghost kitchens could be successful because they focus 100% of building the amazing experience for delivery. Um, having said that, it, 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 um, we have not yet seen anyone being enormously successful as of yet um, because there are also a lot of challenges in that. It's not easy. Um, but I do think that over time we will see it as the volume of delivery will go up. You can also build more efficiencies in those kitchens 
and I think therefore the time is in 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 their advantage. Um, but it will not be easy, but you will see successes in that cases. And we have tried ourselves. We're also happy to partner with other because we don't necessarily see ourselves as restaurant builders, but rather other platform. But uh, but we also want to learn and we want to develop our own thinking. And and but we're also happy to partner with others doing it for us. Um, but, um, yeah, sorry for being a little bit uh, all over the place there, but uh, it's, it's, it's difficult topics. Yeah, thank you very much. It is a tough one, one we've not been able to get our head around yet, but let's see. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Anna. Thanks, Nicholas. I want to uh, shift gears for a minute uh, and turn to you, Lydia. Um, you know, obviously, 2020 uh, continued to raise all of our awareness about how important diversity and inclusion is uh, and how far we have to go. And I wondered if you would mind sharing your perspective on what can the founders, investors, and executives on today's call actually do to prioritize uh, women in tech or venture capital and help grow the next generation of female leaders? Yeah, I, I love the question, Rob, but I, I want to broaden it a little bit. Um, I think the, from my perspective, the racial injustices that have become so starkly clear, especially in the United States over this past year, um, need to be part of this discussion as well. Like from a SoftBank standpoint, we firmly believe, foundationally believe that investing in technology today can unlock greater returns for economies and societies for tomorrow. And of course, you know, my, my perspective and SoftBank's perspective is that minorities and women have to be included in this conversation for, to achieve the, these gains. And so from a SoftBank specific standpoint, we have launched a, a handful of different programs internally this year over the last two years to, to try and take action on our own company level. Uh, one of which is we launched the Emerge Accelerator Program, which was in partnership with WeWork Labs. And that is an accelerator that is focused on supporting an underrepresented founder group and getting to the table and getting their first round of funding. Uh, developing and building those companies and then supporting them to getting eventual growth funding, growth funding beyond. Um, the Opportunity Fund was a, a, a fund that we launched, an actual capital fund this year, which is $100 million of committed capital, which is targeted at uh, supporting underrepresented founders at an early stage in their capital raising cycle. And Connect and Lead, which is something I'm participating in uh, later today, which is where we bring together the women who are leaders within our portfolio companies to a networking event to help support and uh, build connections and ties amongst them. But I, I think there is a, a bigger question um, than, than these discrete programs, which we spend a lot of time thinking about, and one of which is how do we make sure that we change the um, the demographics of the set of leaders who sit at venture capital funds. And so I think that that only happens if we acknowledge the problem. It's venture capital is, is not like the tech businesses that we fund. They are not, you know, these are not rapidly growing businesses, multiplying headcounts. Nicholas talks about having 35,000 plus employees. You're never going to see a venture capital fund that scales like that. And so I think with every seat that comes open in venture capital, we have a duty to make sure that we're evaluating a, a diverse set of candidates. And that's something that we do at SoftBank through, um, through real process in our own recruiting and, and hiring processes. Um, I, but I, I would throw it out there to the audience as well, which is I am such a firm believer that we are seeding right now this, this foundational cycle, this, this positive cycle, which is as these companies were supporting and building um, are growing so rapidly and making sure that we bring diversity into the heads of those organizations so that they can contribute to the scale of those companies. Because I think if we look forward to the future, giving these uh, individuals access to that experience will make it that much easier to raise capital going forward. And so if I look across our portfolio, you know, we, we have not done a tremendously good job at backing women and minorities at the heads of our companies today. But I look at that next layer down and the layer below that of executives who are growing these extraordinary companies. And I know that these people are going to be better positioned than ever before to raise capital going forward. And it is our job as an industry to make sure we support them going forward. Um, but I'll, I'll call to all the founders here. You know, I think the companies have an enormous role to play in making sure that we have diversity in these very, very fast, large organizations where there is a lot of opportunity to make change. Nicholas, do you want to add any? Thoughts to that? I think there's so much to be done, but I don't want to answer from a VC 
point of view. I think what, what Lydia mentioned before are, are some of it. Uh, also, when we invest, we really try to make sure that we have an unbiased process, maybe even favor in some cases. Um, but so, so I rather want to be focused on what can we do in our organization and, and make it very tangible because it's very easy to speak very broad and, and so on, but then in the end, you don't take actions. Um, so if you look at some of the actions we do is that we, we clearly make sure that uh, we build succession planning in our organization and the succession plan needs to include both male and female candidates. Uh, when we hire, we make sure that we have a very balanced candidate pool to choose from. Um, into every role that we hire, at least on senior level, that there is a both female and male candidate. And sometimes it can be harder to, to uh, or we have to, to look in different places to find uh, you know, a female candidate and male candidate. And we have to change then our process and, and making sure the way we communicate, the way we work, making sure that um, uh, we, 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 uh, we are mindful um, of the audience um, and, and, and uh, um, yeah, so, so th 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 there's a lot of things that we've done and I, I, I can continue on, on different initiatives and mentorship and other things, but I think some of the course that I believe in is to making sure that hiring process is very fair and we're making sure that we, we have a balanced approach there when we uh, candidate review succession planning, I think is usually important to making sure that we give the possibility of women stepping up in the organization. Um, now I speak only about diverse students, uh, male, female, but of course uh, that also goes uh, on other topics. I think Delivery has done tremendously well on uh, diversity in terms of, of cultural aspects and, and so on. We still have work to be done on the, the, the women uh, men topic. Uh, we are a, a, a tech company and we have a big tech team and we're still underrepresented when it comes to, to female in, in those regards. Um, also making sure we have an equitable system that we make sure that we payment and salaries and levels uh, so that we really drill into the tangible part. Um, yeah, it, I, I encourage every founder to do the same because not only is it a better company and to, to work with, I think it's demanded. And I think any company who's not taking diversity seriously is not gonna be leader in tomorrow. Um, so I think that, that every founder really need to be, be aware and focus on this, or I, I, I think they will, they will struggle in, in the long term. Well, if, you, if you'll forgive me for recognizing we're one minute over, I think I'd love to get you, Alain, to uh, ask your question uh, about uh, gig workers and also about the talent topics we were just talking about, if, I, if you guys wouldn't mind. Hello. Thank you very much. Very, very great interaction. I'm also learning a lot. Uh, I'm Alain Dehaz, the CEO of ADECO Group. And one of the big discussion we have is about, yeah, the, the social protection of all the... the the people working in, in your company and especially delivery hero all the instant logistics and so on and i would like to know if you have a vision on how we should uh, treat these treat these people support these people going forward yeah uh, i think a great question and i think that is a topic that we have also internally a lot and and how do we make sure that uh, they are treated fairly and so on. I think one challenge we have, and I think that's also what we probably have to push harder is that there are certain regulatory changes also happening. Um, we believe that the, the, if you speak about the writer community that, that want to come to us, have a high degree or high will of having the flexibility. They wanna make good money and they wanna be have the flexibility. And, and that also encounter for, for more of, of a freelance concept. Most of them actually want that freelance concept. In some countries, we, we give them an option to be employee or freelance and, and freelance is the more popular option uh, there uh, because it gives more money and, and uh, freedom. But there are a lot of negative sides of that. Um, and I wish there was somewhere in between uh, that you could give additional benefits to someone who's freelance. Uh, that could be a vacation, that could be social security, that could be 
uh, other things. But unfortunately, the, the labor legislation is not really uh, enabling that. Uh, as you add additional benefit, you, they would also be, be seen as, as employees and therefore uh, you take away the, the key benefit that they want to have, which is flexibility. So I think th there is a lot of work on our end, but there's also a lot of work on making sure that we get it right uh, to, to get it with regulators and, and, and the legislation that is happening. Uh, and uh, also when it comes to, for example, bargaining uh, power, uh, making it right. Um, and there is a lot of uh, things that can be done there. On the positive side, I would still say that most riders are quite happy, at least at Delivery Hero, and they actually make significantly more money than what people uh, sometimes refer to or, or mention. Um, but uh, I, I, I still think we can make this so much better. And I think, unfortunately, the regulation is relying on usually legislation back from 58 or, or 60. So it's like 60, 70 year old legislation. And we all know that work today is very different from back then. And uh, we, we also have to make reforms to make sure that we get the best of, of today's world and what technology gives. But, but at the same time, um, that, 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 that they, I don't know, we, we drive also in, uh, a society in a direction where, um, where, where we want it to go. And, and I know we are very happy to, to and maybe we should push it even harder, the agenda there, to making sure that that happens. Um, so, but happy but to support you. The, the, happy to I don't want to say this, but it is a, not an easy topic to tackle. It's a lot of complexities there, and it's very easy to take one or another side. And I think that the truth is somewhere in the middle, and it's not easy solutions, but that should not be an excuse for taking time. Uh, we should still really try to push to getting it right. Um, and and um, I know we, we would be very committed to that as well. Well, I want to say a very humble thank you to Lydia and to Nicholas for joining us today. I know it's been a privilege for me to be in conversation with you. And uh, from all the comments in the chat, I know that our uh, audience and participants has felt the same way. So thank you again very much. Thank, thank you. you very much.